recording this session as well. So, excellent. So welcome everyone. Um, to start off this morning, I am going to welcome the Chair of uh, Opal Collaborative Futures Steering Committee, Catherine Davidson, um, who is going to um, set us up for the morning. Thank you, Annika. Good morning, everybody. I um, have to say these mini conferences, as Annika well knows, heard me say this a million times, are one of my favorite um, things. And that, so that's why I'm especially regretful that I can't join for the entire time. I have to leave early to go co-chair another meeting. So I'm really sorry about that. Um, but I'm delighted to see the turnout, the participation. I'm seeing 127 participants, it looks like. Um, and the real emphasis is on these uh, on these fantastic uh, presentations. Thank you so much to all of you who submitted them. And I will be sure to watch the recording later. But um, right now, I will just read our land acknowledgement. Ontario Tech University acknowledges the lands and people of the Mississaugas of Scugog Island First Nation. And we are thankful to be welcomed on these lands in friendship. The lands we are situated on are covered under the Williams Treaties and the traditional territory of the Mississaugas. I have, I think, a couple of colleagues on the on the line today here with me too. So we are all just uh, adjusting to the news that our um, knowledge keeper, Rick Bork, um, is leaving the institution. And he is um, one of the individuals, hopefully everybody has somebody in their institution who's in a similar role, who really taught me so much authentic um, understanding about what why the, the land acknowledgements are important. Um, so that's my my note of genuine feeling about land acknowledgements and I try to do that every time, not nearly as well as so many other people I've heard. but I would like to thank everybody as I mentioned for your um, all your continued contribution to Collaborative Futures, both with these, with our formal groups and our EAN um, and the participating in, in these kinds of discussions. It, as I said, it's like the highlight is, for me, epitomizes what Collaborative Futures is all about, which is to say, sharing information across a broad network um, with amazing colleagues. We're just so much, you know, so much greater than, than we are individually. I would also like to very much welcome uh, McMaster and OCAD, you as our newest Omni partners, and they will be joining the AFN later in July. So um, this is just fantastic sort of expansion. Um, I, I see, like I haven't gone through all the participants, so I'm not sure if Mandy is on the call, but I, can, I know Randy is. And uh, Rand, I always like to take the opportunity to thank both of you, Randy and Mandy, from the bottom of my heart for your um, your commitment and dedication and humor, Randy, <laughs> um, and food discussion uh, because they have both returned to their to their um, their previous positions. So thank you. And um, the other thing, as um, Annika also knows. I have been talking up these mini conferences with my college library Ontario colleagues, and many of you on the call may or may not know. I don't know um, if you may know that the college libraries Ontario, I think 18 of the 24 or 19 of the 24, are also implementing Alma, and they went through a similar branding exercise, and so their instance, not Omni, is is called Page One Plus. So we invited them, we extended the invitation to this mini conference. They're um, in the throes of implementation right now. And so they may not be able to join, but I certainly hope that they, um, that we can work, you know, even in even larger uh, context than we have to date. So um, those are my welcoming and thanking remarks. And I will look forward to watching the recording later on. So Annika, is that back to you? Oh, thanks, Catherine. Thank you very much for, for taking the time this morning and for all your support of, of the initiative as well. Uh, so this morning, um, we are going to be ably led by Randy, who will be um, moderating the session. So I'll hand over to you, Randy. Hey, everybody. So we're a little bit ahead of schedule, but that has never been a problem as far as I'm concerned. So if our first round of presenters is ready to go and I see them 
on here full of verve and excitement, ready to go. So I'm going to hand it over to them. We have Megan Burke and Dylan Weltman from Queen's University. They're going to be doing our first session called A Bit Beyond the Basics, Three Helpful Tips for Using Alma Analytics. Over to you two. All right, let me share my screen. Right. Is everyone good to go? Okay, wonderful. So um, thank you so much for joining us this morning. Um, first, we'd like to acknowledge that Queen's University is on the territory of the Haudenosaunee and Anishinaabek. Um, it's important to consider uh, where we're coming from today. So uh, my name is Megan Burke, as Randy said, and I'm a metadata and discovery librarian at Queen's. And I am Dylan Wellman. I am a summer intern for, as a data analyst for the Queen's Library. Um, and this presentation is going to cover three easy ways to get more out of Alma Analytics. So, so some background. Um, at Queen's, we've used Alma Analytics for a variety of purposes since migration. In the past year, basically since Dylan joined our team, we've started using analytics for a number of projects and ongoing reporting. This includes our annual reports for ARL and CRL, print stewardship projects such as deduping our humanities and social sciences library, a not yet dedupe shelved is pictured here, and looking for electronic and physical journal overlap and other collection assessment and statistics projects. So we use it quite often. So some basic reports. Many reports in Alma require little or no customization outside of choosing a category and filtering. These reports are great for retrieving basic bibliographic information from say a list of barcodes or MMS IDs, for pulling circulation statistics and creating shelf lists. But what if you're looking for just a little bit more specificity or something that looks and works better for a report? That's where our next three tips come in. Tip one, cleaning up publication dates. Publication date is an important analysis tool. It can help you determine if titles are duplicates or help you see the age of your collection. In analytics, publication dates are pulled from the 264 subfield C, 260 subfield C, or 008 position seven through 10, depending on what's available. As you can see from these examples, there is quite a bit of variation in the way publication dates might be written in any of the fields. Add a simple formula. Adding a simple formula normalizes the publication dates and removes non numerical values like the copyright symbol, thereby creating consistency for better sorting and data analysis. Uh, first, as a preface for all those who are unfamiliar with the all my analytics environment, there are two main pages when creating a query. There's the criteria page where you add the fields in, you edit the fields, and then there's the results page where you see the results of the fields you add to the query. So here in the criteria page, as pictured, we have three uh, lovely fields, the title field, author field, and publication date field. And as we are cleaning up the publication dates, we're gonna select the publication date field and then edit formula. Next slide, please. Uh, once you select that, you'll be brought up to the edit column formula page where you will delete that, uh, that formula that is just pasted there regularly under column formula, and you'll paste in the formula below. And I did not memorize this. I don't expect you guys to memorize this. So please uh, feel free to screenshot uh, this formula, or you could go back in the recording of this conference, but the formula is quite long you copy that and you paste that into the column formula section there. Might I add, there is that custom headings button above. That is also kind of important. If you select that, you can customize what the heading is in your query. So when you paste that formula natively, when you go look at your result, it'll say evaluate reg X rather than publication date. So if you wanna change the title to something, more appealing like publication date, I'd say you should do that. But once you click okay, once you've entered that formula in, next slide please, 
you will see that the publication dates are cleaned up as pictured on the right. On the left is what they used to look like with all these brackets and periods and letters. And on the right, they're nicely cleaned up into just the digits that they are. Great. Thanks, Dylan. Our next tip is using local param. So sometimes you want to analyze a field, but there's no out of the box category for it in analytics. And that's where the local parameter or local param come in. Xlibris provides 20 customizable fields called local parameters. There are 10 in the bibliographic details category and 10 in the holdings details category. All marked data fields between 010 and 999, including fixed fields, can be added as local parameters. Unfortunately, though, you can't subdivide by subfield. So if you request a field with multiple subfields, the whole thing will appear in the results. Um, fields can be swapped out as well. So if you're finished with a project and you won't need to analyze a particular field anymore, you can swap it out for a new one. Um, just make sure you keep track of which is which. Xlibris will not do that for you. So to implement a local parameter, you'll need to submit a Salesforce ticket requesting a local parameter be added to a specific local param field. If you're replacing one local param with a new one, um, specify this in the ticket, and Xlibris will respond once the change is made. And then after that, you'll need to wait 48 hours for re-indexing. So it's not advised to do this when a report is due the next day. Uh, here's where you will find the local parameter fields. They are, as Megan said, under holding details and bibliographic details. There's 10 in each. So please make sure that after you submitted the ticket and you go to find the data, make sure you are selecting the right one because they are different. And yes, they, there are stuff that are natively there before you change the field. Um, I think they're going to implement some, I guess, standard ones in the future, but there are these I guess 10 that you could swap around and play around with. Here's an example of where we used the uh, local parameter. We added the 247 field, which I call the related titles field for journals. Um, I think this one's extremely useful and I would advise this if you are doing an analysis of journals because we ran into some trouble in a project where we noticed uh, that we had not full electronic overlap over a specific journal. And it turns out that the, the journal had a previous name or multiple previous names before. And that I guess is where the related title field comes in handy. You could see in the first row, the new scientist also could be called or has a previous edition called new scientist and science journal. So I guess having this extra layer or this customized customizability that you can add to analytics is really useful for these types of projects. So finally, we'll talk about creating visualizations from Alma Analytics, Alma and Primo Analytics. If you want to get a picture of your Alma and Primo reports without having to invest in a separate tool like Tableau or relearn your intermediate Excel skills, um, analytics has a basic built-in visualization feature. So this feature actually can be quite complex sometimes. Uh, here are some notes to keep in mind before we begin the uh, demo. One, you can only use really two or three fields in creating a visualization. I typically go with two. Uh, and as you can see, we have two fields. And I like to say there's one field to measure and there's one field to count. Uh, the field to measure is kind of what you are, what you're measuring, what's on the X axis typically uh, for this instance, we chose publication dates. And then the field to count is what you are counting within the field. So how many barcodes are there per publication date? How many titles are there per publication date? How many MMS IDs? There's, there's, there's a lot of typical fields that you will select as the field to count. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so first we select the field that we're counting. So I chose barcodes and you click edit formula as we did in the publication date cleanup uh, example. Then there is an F dot 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 button, which means function. Um, you're gonna select that at the bottom of the uh, edit column formula tab. And then a new tab will pop up called insert function. 
Um, and under that, there is a folder called aggregates, and then you're going to select count. Uh, that will apply the count filter or formula to your uh, to your uh, formula or your, to your column, and then you select OK, and then the formula is applied. Once you go back to the results section, next slide, please. Uh, you will see that we have our field, which is publication dates. Uh, you'll see 1809, there's one barcode per 1809, 1807, two barcodes, et cetera. And that goes all the way down to probably 2022. Next slide, please. Then this is where it gets fun. We have the uh, graph button. Uh, you'll click that. And here's where I kind of, you, you kind of have your own choice or options because no matter what you click, it'll kind of work out really well. But my recommendation is you either use the bar or line graph because they typically are the easiest and uh, most understandable. Uh, under each bar and line, there is this recommended subtypes uh, button, which will automatically generate a graph that looks best. If it's too much data for vertical or horizontal, it kind of figures that out. So I always click the recommended subtype and you will get the desired format. Next slide, please. And here are two examples of visualizations made with the same publication data as we saw. I think this is incredibly powerful for looking at an overview of a collection. Let's say this is an art collection or a law collection. You kind of get to see the publication dates specified for that entire collection and at a very quick and accessible way within this tool. Um, this could be converted into widgets in, for the main Alma page for your librarians. This could be added to dashboard, so you could kind of see multiple pieces of data. And I think this is an extremely easy uh, way to just get a glimpse of your data. Also keep in mind yeah. that when you create one of these reports, you have to scroll all the way down below uh, the data to actually find the graphs. Because sometimes I've clicked that generate graph button and I didn't see anything. So if you have that confusion, just understand that this is below all the data once you scroll all the way down. All right. Thank so, you. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Um, I think we have time for questions now, right? If Absolutely. Okay. Um, yeah, so what so, I'll ask is, sorry, go ahead. Oh, I was going to say I can stop sharing so I can see the chat if that people are sending them to chat. Yeah, and if I could just ask folks to um, put their hands up. So at the very bottom of your Zoom screen right down here, uh, you should see reactions. And if you click reactions, one of the options is raise hand. So if you can use the raise hand option, if you'd like to unmute and talk, just so we can sort of like manage it a little easier. We've got 10, 11 minutes for questions. Uh, Shu Zen from Windsor. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Hi, Megan. Good morning. And hi, Dylan. I don't know how to pronounce your name properly. I, you know, thank you so much for the presentation. And it's really, really helpful. But I just have a question for clean up about, you know, the, you know, the publication date. So I saw in the left hand side, you have, you know, the you know, bracket and, you know, the C and something like U, U, U. I, I understand, you know, that looks like it's not a standard. And on the, the this hand side, you without any, you know, like a bracket, C or whatever. So my question is, sometimes we may use, you know, the, you know, the uh, copyright, you know, the, you know, that, that you know, you know, the, uh, the stuff. So how you can separate them, you know, something we need that, something we do not need that. So how we can do that? That's my question. So I like to use that this tip for an overview, not really for the specifics with the copyright or the brackets or any other data. As we saw in the last example, I actually use the same publication date formula because I, I, I'm, you're not able to actually visualize what I, I did in the end if you don't clean up the publication data. That's because rather than having the 200 years between 19 or 1800 and 2000, you'll have thousands and thousands of years because there will be 1880 C, 1885 with the brackets. And rather than that, you have these clean dates. Yes, those, those brackets and the copyright are extremely useful and important. I would recommend if you want to separate them, 
to have uh, to do that in Excel or Open or Fine or one of those tools because if you really want to separate them and clean them up there, but this was more of a I guess in Alma hack or something to kind of consolidate it and clean it up for an overview. Yeah, I know in you know according to copyright, you know the sorry, according to the you know the cataloging rule, you know the bracket means something, you know, you are guessing whatever. So you cannot really take it over. Okay, thank you. Yeah. It's really like an average age of the collection sort of statistic. So if you want to do something where you're calculating how many books did you buy in the 80s, that's kind of the the way that you would um, you would use that particular function. Okay, thank you. Very good presentation. Awesome. <clears throat> Any other questions? I see we had uh, Megan respond to a question from Susan. Uh, Susan was asking if you could drop the um, actual code for the regex uh, in the chat, and it's down in there now. And uh, don't forget, um, Annika also mentioned that we'll be sharing the slides and this recording afterwards as well. So you have access to all of that too. Jeff, do you have a question? No. Just ready. I'm just ready. No worries. Jordan <coughs> Patterson. I thank you both for the presentation. Um, all really useful tips, uh, especially the, the first one. I uh, always have trouble cleaning up my dates. Uh, I wanted to ask if you could speak to your thinking um, when you have two years. Um, I, I, I noticed in, in, in your example, I think there was one case and you chose the later year. Um, is this something that would also kind of fall um, into your thinking of, of just kind of getting a general, uh, a general sense of things kind of quick and dirty? Or did you have a reason for choosing one year over the other? So I actually didn't build this formula. I found this in a very old uh, Alma Analytics thread uh, from a while back. And yes, it was the quick and dirty to get an overview. Um, but honestly, I'm very happy it chose the later year because if it's a serial or a journal, it's useful to know when the journal comes up to. Obviously, if you're doing a more specific analysis of a specific journal or collection, then it's important to know the span and the specific coverage of it. But yeah, I like to I like the quick and dirty, uh, uh, I guess, mindset because it gets an overview of an entire collection without kind of having to do a lot of cleanup. I'll also say that I think for a lot of those, they're like um, legacy cataloging where putting the print date and the publication date was something that was, or the original publication date and then the print date was something. So we'd have to look at that, those more specifically to see like if we had a whole list of ones with two dates to see which date we would want to choose. But in a large list where the majority of them have one date with like that C instead of the copyright symbol or whatever, um, that's where we're kind of looking to clean those up. Yeah. Thank you very much. Because I'm the DJ, I'm going to ask the last question. <laughs> um, I just wanted to double check. The first example you gave where you had the regex that was sort of modifying the data, to be clear, that data is only modified in the report that you're pulling. You're not actually modifying those dates in the, okay. So yeah, that was it could, also, it could also be used, find your uses for it with the, in mind that it will be, I guess, non-specific and it's for an overview but it can also be used in other instances. I personally used it in uh, the enumeration fields. It kind of shows volume or individual volumes of a journal and that could also be messy. So if you kind of want a by volume overview of what year each volume is that isn't messy, I've used it in that uh, context too. It, it, it has multiple uses of so explore and find where it could be useful. Awesome. Everyone, please join me in thanking Dylan and Megan. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you. And over to our next presentation, which is the Jeff Sinclair. You all know him. You all love him. He's going to be giving a presentation for us on that data syncing feeling. Over to you, Jeff. I'm unmuted now, aren't I? 
There are. Good. All right. Excellent. So, uh, just a prelude here. I uh, speaking of data syncing feeling. I, I, I found out last night that uh, there were three slides of this of this presentation uh, on Microsoft OneDrive for a very frightening five minutes before my computer synced and, and got the rest of the slides that I finished on Friday. So, data syncing. Yep. Just a quick overview. I'm going to talk about uh, hiding titles, different ways we can hide titles, uh, and tagging titles, uh, and a bit of a case study um, using uh, about using analytics to create sets, and a little bit about the various options for uh, working with WorldCat to do your OCLC data sync. So. <clears throat> I don't know, maybe um, maybe some of you have nothing to hide, but we do. We have various uh, things that we don't want um, people to see. Uh, so what, what kinds of physical items do you wanna hide? Well, uh, you know, you might have like a, a library, an entire library. Can you imagine that, like an entire library? I mean, like who, who would wanna hide like a complete uh, library these days? I, I really don't know who that would be. Um, and there they go. You might have a location that you don't want people to see um, or a collection. Uh, that would be kind of weird because, you know, typically use collections to uh, make things discoverable or pub publicize them more, but you know, whatever, you might have a, some kind of secret collection that you have. Uh, more typically process types. So you might not want to show something that's, um, in the process of being acquired, or you might not want to show things that are lost. And certain kinds of bibliographic records, for example, brief bibliographic records. And if you're also syncing um, electronic resources with OCLC, you might want to hide various kinds of portfolios. So you might want to hide your patron driven acquisition DDA collections uh, so that they don't, don't appear as visible. Uh, Complementary collections, I, uh, there's a lot of the JSTOR collections are going away, so you may not want to report those as being owned. Uh, could be trials uh, that you're, you want not to show. Uh, collections with poor metadata, and there are a few of those in the community zone. And uh, even worse, uh, collections with unreliable metadata. So I wanted to talk a little bit about the different ways to hide things. Uh, so we do this typically with tagging. Uh, the first type of tagging is uh, the kind that you use to hide uh, titles from Primo VE, and that's uh, in Alma, that's tag suppressed title. There's a second one called tag suppressed from external search. And uh, that means that uh, those records can't be found using Z3950 or SRU searches. And if you um, don't have your SRU set up yet, I invite you to join the 21st century and uh, set up an SRU server. It's really easy. Um, so if you um, Tag suppressed from external search. Um, sorry. Yeah, this is uh, in MDE. You would set management tags, export to WorldCAD, don't publish. Uh, if you tag suppressed from external search, again, that's through the MDE, that is using the set management tags, export to WorldCAD, publish BIM. And uh, if you want to publish holdings only, and I don't think anyone is using that, but if anyone is using, uh, is exporting local holdings, uh, I would be interested to talk about that. So I want to give a bit of a case study. Uh, we have a science fiction collection at Trent, which has about 2,200 titles. Uh, this collection is in very poor condition, and currently it's in storage awaiting a collection decision. Uh, however, some of these titles are also in the general collection. So um, 
one thing I could have done is just say, well, if it's in this uh, collection, like suppress everything. But uh, then, you know, I would also be suppressing those titles that are in the general collection. So how can I find um, the titles that are in both collections? And the solution to that is to use analytics. And right now I'm gonna give a little bit of a live demo. So I've created this uh, report in analytics. It's called MMS IDs of titles in suppressed locations. So if I look at that, it shows me all these various uh, titles, M MMS IDs, sorry, uh, MMS IDs of items that are in suppressed locations. And if I open the criteria, you can see that I have the MMS ID uh, where suppressed from discovery is equal to yes. And this suppressed from discovery is not at the title level, but at the location level. So the location that the physical item is, um, that has that MMS ID is in a suppressed location. So that's great. I can see all the things that are in suppressed locations, but uh, what I really wanna know is uh, those things that are in both suppressed and unsuppressed locations. Two. So if I look at this report, I can see that here are all the things that are in both suppressed and unsuppressed. And the way I can do this is to use a filter. And the filter is that I'm using a report. So I'm using the MMS IDs from another analysis, which is the um, report that shows all of the uh, suppressed IDs. So within uh, WorldCat, there are lots of different options. You can uh, add, have records automatically added. Uh, you can include local bibliographic data. You can choose whether or not to uh, have records returned and you can have holdings visibility set. But basically, this means that you can have more than one data sync collection on WorldCat. But Alma is kind of set up so that you really only have the, the generic export is only set up so that uh, you have one publishing profile where everything goes to. So it's nice because that's easy, but then you have basically one choice for the configuration on the WorldCat end. Uh, another option is that you can use a general publishing profile. So the advantage of this is that instead of, you know, publishing everything that doesn't have that suppressed, uh, you know, uh, export to OCL, export to uh, WorldCat uh, set, that you can use um, logical sets to export records. Uh, so you can have multiple data sync collections. So it's uh, a little bit more complex and then you lose that manual uh, force export to WorldCat option. And then there are, uh, you know, you can do even more complex things. So you could do the publishing profile to an intermediate uh, server and then, uh, you know, manipulate the records uh, in the middle there. Uh, but that uh, obviously is going to add additional complexity and additional points of failure, potential failure. So uh, some options for WorldCat and data syncing. Any questions? Excellent. Thank you very much, Jeff. So we're open to questions now. So if anyone would like to ask a question, please use the reactions button at the bottom of your screen and then choose the raise hand option just so we can sort of coordinate it all and uh, or type your question into the chat. I know Guelph has just been working with OCLC to get our sync, well, not the sync restarted, the initial refresh, um, and it's taken like a month or more. 
Yeah, we just we just finished the initial sync. And um, so interesting thing is that uh, once you do the initial sync, that, in, that initial data sync collection, you can't use that for ongoing sync. You basically need to set up um, data sync, <laughs> your own data sync. So this is why I mentioned the various options. So like the easiest one would just be to use the default publish to OCLC, but it's, it's not the only way you could use the general publishing profile and just put the OCLC settings in there. Okay. Well, everyone, join me in thanking Jeff for his presentation on that data syncing feeling. And if we did have awards, he would absolutely get one for awesome title. Nice work, Jeff. Thanks, Randy. Okay, we have about three minutes till the next session starts. The next session is also with Jeff Sinclair, so don't get too far, Jeff. Uh, and it's going to be on floating a collection. Um, what I like to do to sort of like bridge the time is to ask people questions. So since Jeff's going to get ready flipping his session over, it is berry season, at least Ontario strawberry season. So I'm curious what your favorite berry is. And Jeff, I'm going to ask you first because you're right here and you're a captive audience. Jeff, what's your favorite berry? Oh, uh, I got to go with strawberry. Yeah. We're, we're heading into that season now, so I, I, I usually make some jam. Nice. I see Ian Gibson has said raspberries. Yes. Some more strawberries. Yep. Raspberries are blackberries. Ooh, Alex is throwing out the black currant. Yep. Oh, look at everybody. So excited. I should have done a poll. Blueberries. Oh, yeah. See, I was traumatized when I was younger because my dad thought everybody loved blueberries because he loved blueberries. And so anything that could come in a flavor came in blueberry. And so now I have this like aversion to blueberries, but yes, wild blueberries from Northern Ontario and a few other provinces, I think Saskatchewan, apparently very tiny little guys, but packed with flavor and deliciousness. And he berry as long as it's in a cake or a pie, buddy. I'm, I'm on board for that. Megan, were your little, were the wild strawberries, were they little guys? They tend to also be little and packed with delicious. Yes, they're like, it's it's like a strawberry, but the flavor is so concentrated. It's my favorite. Yeah. Blueberry liquor. I don't know if I can pick that, Ingrid. <laughs> I mean, I can pick it from the liquor store. <laughs> I know um, our friend Dan Scott, uh, who is at Laurentian, he has a very broad has cap berry collection and i've never heard of a has cap they're like a long berry and apparently taste a smidge like a blueberry but better and different uh apparently they're very very populous in the northern parts of ontario oh jack says strawberry ice cream yes on board okay thank you very much for that quick departure and now please join me again in welcoming jeff sinclair and this time, he's going to be talking to us about floating a collection. Over to you, Jeff. Thanks, Randy. Uh, I guess I used up all my uh, clever originality with the previous title. This is a little bit less uh, funny. So floating a collection. OK, overview. What is a floating collection? Some of you will know. Some of you will not. Uh, why would we want to do this? And what are we floating? And how are we doing it? So first of all, what is a floating collection? Um, materials are reshelved at the returning library rather than the owning library. So if I take out a book from library A, or if I request, if I'm a patron of library A, and I request a um, book from library B within the same institution, uh, it gets transited to library A, and I check it out there. Typically, it would go, you check it back in library A, and it gets transited back to library B which is fine in some circumstances, but you know, perhaps there's actually more demand for that title at library A versus library B. Uh, ideally, if, if you float 
titles, float materials. Uh, materials should migrate to the location where they're used most. Uh, they should spend less time in transit. Um, and the reason why you may not have heard about this is this practice is more associated with public libraries where you have uh, branches that are essentially very similar versus in academic libraries where you typically have uh, more specialized libraries. So you wouldn't necessarily want to float things between um, a law library and your uh, you know, main library or a music library in your main library, because we might not have really places to shelve this stuff. So what are we floating? Uh, we have two libraries at Trent. Uh, there's one in Peterborough we call BATA, and one in Oshawa, this is the Germ Campus Library. So the Germ Campus Library is newer and smaller, uh, but also it is growing at a more rapid pace than the uh, Peterborough uh, campus. And the uh, library is smaller. Uh, however, <laughs> it has less densely packed shelves than the main library. Uh, we are, we're at a definite space crunch uh, in Peterborough. So Germ had a little bit of spare capacity. Uh, there was a floating collection in the previous uh, ILS, and I think um, if any of you migrated from Symphony, uh, Circe Dynix Symphony, you might know about the floating collection capabilities. I think it was a, um, an item type in, in Symphony. And finally, uh, the most important thing is that it had support of librarians and library staff uh, to, to do this. So what are we floating? We are floating materials from the general collection, basically the stacks. Uh, we are floating things one way, so things would float to Durham, but Durham items wouldn't float to Bata. Uh, we're excluding uh, certain types of things. I think course reserves wouldn't ever really go through transit, but I'm not positive on that. Uh, but other things definitely like maps and government documents. There's a, a BED a curriculum collection, uh, current periodicals. These things wouldn't uh, float to um, float to Durham. So how are we flowing it? Well, kind of spoiler, uh, I really couldn't find a way to do exactly what I wanted to do, which is, you know, the assessment happens when, um, it's checked in, it's like, oh, am I something that might wanna float? Should I just stay here where I've been checked in? Uh, yes, no, okay. Uh, but uh, that I don't think that there's exactly a way to do that in Alma. Uh, if people do know of something, uh, I'd be curious to know. I think there is a, a webhook um, that you can use <laughs> when things are checked in, but I think uh, by that point it would be too late because I think the transit would already you know, happen. It would already be in transit back to the other library. Um, so the present solution evaluates items that are currently on loan. Uh, so basically it says, well, this thing has been transited to Durham from BATA and now it's on loan. So this is when the, um, the algorithm kicks in, it says, okay, this thing whose home location is BATA, it's been checked out at Durham. So that's, this assumes that uh, the item that's checked out at Durham is gonna be checked back in at Durham, which isn't always the case, but uh, I think it's gonna be, you know, 95% of the time true. Uh, and the solution uses analytics. So it only works when materials go out longer than one day. So if um, if I receive something at Durham, I check it out, I think, you know, I, I take it, you know, do some photocopying, check it back in, it's not gonna float because it hasn't had a chance to hit the analytics. So how do we do it? There's two daily reports, uh, items, uh, checked out at Durham that have uh, that are in BATA locations uh, and items checked out of BATA that are in Durham locations. So the, the script uh, runs on a daily basis 
and it picks up these reports uh, that are scheduled um, using SFTP. Uh, and it checks, it does kind of a sanity check to make sure uh, whether all the with materials fulfill all the criteria to be floated. And then the script assigns a temporary location to those items, or it removes the temporary location. So if it's been checked out at Durham and it's about a thing, the script will change the temporary location to Durham so that when it's checked back in, it will be it will say reshelf a germ. Uh, and if it is something that was previously floated to germ and it gets loaned at BATA, which means it's been requested and transited back to BATA, uh, if it's on loan and has a temporary location of germ, that will be removed. That temporary location will be removed. So how this works, like kind of a... Um, an overview here, you have the item being loaned, say, Monday at 4 p.m. The analytics indexing finishes, say, Tuesday at 3.37 a.m. And then the analytics report is run. This is the one that generates those two reports, items on items with home location or items with location, BATA, checked out a germ, and vice versa. That might happen at 6 a.m. And then the script runs to either assign or remove uh, temporary location. So this is a uh, um, kind of a bigger overview of what the script actually does, retrieves the reports, and re reads in a, uh, a candidate to float, and it's just basically a text, uh, text file. And it checks, does it meet the criteria to float? Uh, yes. If it says yes, it changes the item temporary location. Uh, if not, it just logs it and say, well, this thing, nope, is not, and here's why. And then, uh, then it goes on to a, uh, an unfloating loop. So what are the challenges with the floating collection? Uh, well, there are uh, differences in the spine labeling between the two libraries. So there's always the danger that staff might assume that um, materials um, should be sent, you know, in this case, usually sent back to BATA uh, if they don't, if they're not watching the screen. So that could, and, and if that happens, I, I think what would happen is it would automatically be retransited back to Durham. Um, there was an error in my program for several months that meant uh, no items were being unfloated uh, since fixed. And um, I'm including this, this reading here. It was uh, uh, in the Journal of Access Services, uh, talks about the various reasons and challenges for floating a collection in an academic library. And any questions? Excellent, thanks so much, Jeff. Yes, if you could use the reactions button at the bottom of your screen, throw your hand up or type your question into the chat on the right-hand side. This seems like something that would be really exciting for any institution with a smaller affiliate campus, um, just for the reasons that you guys have done it, right? If there's geographic distance between them and you have to go through the efforts of shipping something to somewhere, then it's like, oh, well, let's leave it here until it's requested again. Exactly, yep. Jordan, Fulbrook, over to you. Jeff, um, I'm not sure if this is maybe a silly question, but just so that I'm understanding correctly. So when the report is run and it has the, the script run as well, um, so does it automatically add and remove the temporary location? Yeah, the script, the script is, does that automatically. It uses the, uh, the Alma APIs to do that. Oh, cool. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Excellent. Any other questions from folks? Susan Bond has a question. Uh, this is super interesting. I'm trying to figure out if the same model could work if you wanted to float things in both directions or more with more libraries. Do you think that would be possible? Yeah, I mean, um, I, I think you could, this is the nice thing about doing it with the script because you can basically use any logic, uh, any, any of the information that you can uh, access through the API, 
you can use that uh, as logic for whether something should float or not float. And certainly you could do it both ways. We didn't uh, in this case because uh, we have less room at, at beta and also the, the spine labeling said like everything is like really branded, uh, you know, with the germ campus. <laughs> so it's, I, I kind of felt that uh, those things would be more likely to, to face that issue of being you know, like sent right back to, to germ and ended up in doing exactly what I don't want, which is for things to be in, in transit unnecessarily. Thanks, Jeff. Any other questions from folks? Okay, well, join me in thanking Jeff. Thank you, Jeff. Thanks, Randy. Follow-up question. So we've already discussed some of our favorite berries, and we have a couple of minutes before we hear from our next session by Carolyn Sullivan. She's going to be talking about enabling open library covers API. So my question for you folks is, what is your favorite flavor of pie? Or one of your favorite flavors? Because, I mean, I don't discriminate when it comes to pie. Okay, lots of apple, key lime. Ooh, peach, yeah. I like a good raspberry peach, coconut cream. Rhubarb, tis the season, friend, for rhubarb pie. Bumbleberry. To me, bumbleberry always sounds like something you would eat in a cartoon, but it's a real thing. But doesn't it just sound like it's a pretend berry? Oh, Alex pulling out the pecans. Oh, Ingrid, savory meat pie. And, you know, just an alternative to the pecan pie is anyone who's from the Quebec region or has been there, the sugar pie or the, I don't know what it is in French and I'll butcher it if I try, but, you know, the sugar pie, which is basically a pecan pie without the pecans. Quiche is a pie. I'm on board and I love eggs. Yes, thank you, Janice. Tarte au sucre. Lemon merengue pie. That's what I like to say for that one. It makes it sound fancier. Partridge pie. Krista, what's in a partridge pie? Is it a bird? Yes, Matthew Fisher, tarte au sucre. It's a partridge berry. Okay, well, I'm gonna have to do some research. And Dan says he's gonna change this to quiche. I'm on board with that, Dan. I love a good eggs are like, mm. Okay, it's 1029, thank you, oh. Krista says they are red and round and a lot like cranberries. Oh, so they're real tart-like and make you pucker up. Bird pie. Okay, okay, okay. All right, friends. I'm really hungry for pie now. Um, make that face again, sure. That's me eating a um, partridge berry. Uh, all right, friends, we're going to turn things over to Carolyn Sullivan. She's from the University of Ottawa. There she is. Hello. She's going to be doing a session for us entitled Enabling Open Library Covers. Thank you very much. Over to you, Carolyn. Thank you, Randy. One moment, please, while I get up my no slides. Uh, okay. Can everyone see this? You sure can. Awesome. OK, so good morning. As Randy mentioned, I'm Carolyn Sullivan, and I'm the systems librarian for digital repositories at the University of Ottawa Library. And today I'll be discussing with you how you can enrich Omni with thumbnail images, book covers that would not otherwise appear through an example using the Open Library Covers API. So where do the thumbnail images visible in Omni out of box come from? Um, they come from two sources, either Google Books or Syndetics. And 
Additional thumbnail images can be added to the discovery layer through different methods, such as the Omni subscription integration that Ellie Visser discussed back in March 2021, or through thumbnail templates. And thumbnail templates allow you to add images from other repositories using data in the MARC record. So one rich source of cover images is the Open Library Covers API, a side project of the Internet Archive. And the Open Library Covers API is used by groups such as the National Library of Australia and the open source ILS software Evergreen. It allows its covers to be called using an API with unlimited access to cover images through their unique identifiers, the Open Library ID, and through rate limited access with ISBN, OCLC number, and LCCN. So the first example of where you might use this, um, the University of Ottawa displays records of resources accessible through the Internet Archive and Omni. So my initial purpose for plugging into the Open Library Covers API was to add cover thumbnails to these records because they all had the default icon there. Since the Open Library Covers API is managed by the Internet Archive, I'm consulting the MARC record as you see here. All the records um, coming from the Internet Archive also have an Open Library Covers API ID within the URL for accessing that book's metadata. And you can see that there in the 856 field. So if you go into the thumbnail configuration template, Elma provides an easy way to extract that unique identifier from the metadata and add it into a URL to call the API for this thumbnail image whenever Omni loads the item record. What you need to do is provide a template for the URL call, information on which field in the MARC record contains the unique identifier and regular expression to tell Alma what information to pull from the mark field. And you can see here, it's in the 856 field. So I put that down there, field indicators, subfield, and then the regular expression. Now the template is literally the URL for the API call with a variable in place of the book identifier. You have to use linking parameter one as the variable. And to get the open library ID from the MARC record, you have to select normalize using regular expression in the thumbnail template configuration settings. And as we've seen earlier before from Dylan and Megan's presentation, regular expressions are extremely helpful. They are a means of encoding a search pattern in text. And you can also use them for things like detecting errors in metadata, either in Elma's built-in analytics, or if you want to pull um, data out of Elma and run it through scripts. Really great stuff. <laughs> so here's some basic regular expressions. I learned from some community developers working with the Open Library Covers API that the basic format of an Open Library ID is OL followed by one or more digits followed by a letter. This encodes to this regular expression, which I added to the thumbnail template. You also have to add brackets to this regular expression. Normally, unnecessary brackets don't do anything to a regular expression, but every time Elma sees 
unnecessary brackets around a regular expression, it substitutes it for the linking parameter in the template URL. This is going to be very important later, I found out. So after all that, the standard book icon in Omni has been replaced by this beautiful thumbnail image. So having done that, I attempted to add thumbnail images from the Open Library Covers API using the ISBN codes. Spoiler alert, uh, this regular expression didn't work. Those of you who have been paying close attention can probably tell why by looking at this image. However, if you're in the dark as I was, Ex Libris explained that I could see the call that Primo was making to the Open Library Covers API using the network tab in the browser development tools. So you can see there I checked out the request URL. And this was the call that was being made. It was adding the ISBN twice, once for each unnecessary pair of brackets that was in the initial regular expression. Eliminating the unnecessary brackets enabled the regex to work correctly. And then this lovely thumbnail appeared. Two. Awesome. So there's some resources and that's how you add thumbnail images available through an API service to Omni. Uh, we still have some unresolved questions about thumbnail images that you might be able to answer or might have comments on. Uh, for example, what other APIs have you seen that might be a source of thumbnail images? Or how would you go about configuring a password protected API to um, load thumbnail images? For example, we subscribe to an API through a service called Memento, which is a database of thumbnail images and book summaries for French language resources. And to access the API, you have to make a call to the server using a protected password and key. The service then provides you with a token that works for 60 minutes to access it. And there's no way to configure that in the thumbnail configuration. So maybe that has to be done using something like an integration profile, but not sure yet. So uh, questions, comments, advice, all of that would be great. Awesome, thank you so much, Carolyn. So again, folks, if you could use the reactions button at the bottom of the screen and then the raise hand option, if you'd like to unmute and ask a question or type it into the chat on the right hand side. Uh, we do have a question already from Evelyn Smith. Uh, they ask, does this work for video content? Is this more successful with older titles? Um, I haven't tried this with video content. It's only been the thumbnail configuration is just for like the search results that come up. Um, as far as if it's more successful with older titles, um, I suppose it's more likely that the Internet Archive would have um, uploaded older titles simply based on the volume of donations that they get. But some of the French language resources I've found and language resources that aren't English, I found that it's been easier to get newer titles and images from those resources through um, the Open Library Covers API than having them out of box. Um, Excellent. OK, Jeff had his hand up first, so we're going to go over to Jeff. Thanks for a great presentation. Um, I, I'm just a, a little bit confused about which URLs get evaluated. Like, is it evaluating every URL, or do you is that controlled through uh, the template or the regex 
to limit the number of URLs that are being evaluated. Okay, so it's controlled through the template and you can see that this is the URL that's getting evaluated and the open library ID for whatever particular resource we're trying to get the cover image from gets swapped in for the linking parameter one. Does that okay. make sense? I, I think so. So if you go back to the the configuration screen. This one? Yeah. Yes. Okay, I see. Yeah, the URL up here is just like the regular metadata URL. And I had to pull the um, open library ID out of that regular URL using the regular expression to swap into the other URL to get the thumbnail image. Oh, okay. So I think, sorry, my question then is, uh, how, how does it know is it is it evaluating every 856 in the record or ju just the ones that start www.openlibrary? It'll look at the 856 fields and any that match the normalization pattern, it'll nab the OL ID out of there. Okay. Okay. Cool. Um, one one thought about um, password protection in, in the template, uh, there's a way to encode username and password within a URL. Um, with headers or? No, just a simple, uh, and this one I think works with um, simple HTTP authentication, but you can do like a username colon password at, and then the rest of the URL. But, but not HTTPS? Yeah, I think you could do that. Oh, okay. Yeah. Cool. We're chatting. I know what I know what Carolyn's doing this weekend. <laughs> hey, Jeff. <laughs> Thanks, Jeff. Thanks. Okay, Daniel had his hand up next. Dan Andrade, over to you. Uh, so yeah, my question kind of is in the same vein of Kevin's in the chat there. Um, and I, I was just wondering, like, uh, if, if there if there's a thumbnail image that's coming from Google or um, you know Alma Source. Um, will this overwrite that or like how does the you know how does it pick which one to use uh, do you know that or is it just yes it's going to use the google books or alma one before any custom configuration and actually if you look at the um calls that are being made it's actually making the calls to the um google books and the syndetic services before it makes the call to the um, custom configuration service Perfect, thank you. Awesome. And that takes care of Kevin's question too. Uh, and then Alex added a comment. We've done something like this at Queens just on a manual basis with a focus on things that are being used in Primo collections only. So when they use the collections feature um, to make sure that they're not you know, highlighting things with no cover art, they're doing that manually. Okay, it's 10.45. Please join me in thanking Carolyn. Um, excellent presentation. And Jeff has popped in chat how to do the authentication thing for you, Carolyn, too. And right now, we have about a 10-minute break before our next session begins at 10.55. I will not ask any questions this time because I want to encourage you all to enjoy a bio break. So we'll see you back here just prior to 10.55.
I know I said I wasn't going to ask any questions, but what I didn't do is I didn't say that I wouldn't show you this neat new thing that's available in Zoom. So I want to do that. And I know I can see Jax is on tenterhooks, just awaiting the delight and joy that is about to happen. So some people like cats. And what you can do is you can actually have an avatar where it follows my eyebrows. And like, I don't know if you guys have noticed, but I am very fair haired. And so on a good day, you can barely see that I actually have existing eyebrows. But check this out. It actually follows my eyebrows. Look at, I'm a little puppy dog. And you're all probably wondering, how do I get there? Well, Panda's going to tell you how. So in your main window, in the lower left, it'll say, uh, well, it probably says start video for you guys because you're not sharing your video. So if you click the little up arrow and then you click on choose video filter, then you'll see one beside the word beta, it says avatars. And if you click on avatars, then you will be able to choose from a wide variety of trash panda um, of little creatures. And each one is doubled. So there is one with a regular sweater like I am wearing right now. And there is a hoodie. So I don't know why they thought it was so important that there needs to be both options available hoodie and no hoodie. Um, also, if you don't see the avatars tab, it's because you haven't updated to the most, most recent version of Zoom. Um, I would not recommend going out right now and updating it because we are in the middle of a presentation session. Uh, but I think this little teddy bear is the cutest one that is my favorite. Yes, Lee Jackson, the raccoon has the best eyebrows, although teddy bear's eyebrows are pretty cute, too. It also, I don't think it, does it monitor my blinking? At any rate, I just love it, and I think everyone should enjoy this. Um, you're very welcome, Allie Visser. Oh, Jack's figured it out. You're a kitty cat now. Who my kitty cat? Finally. It's about time. Good. I know. Golly, Miss Molly. I keep collecting There's... them and they keep not turning me into a cat. <laughs> and I mean, they are very excited about cows because there are two varieties of cows. What I would suspect is a Jersey or Guernsey cow, which I currently am. And Vicky is currently sporting the Holstein. But if you have like little nephews, <laughs> or nieces or, you know, little kids and your fans and you want to do like a fun little call, like this is a fun way to do that. And the bunny is also a favorite of mine, although it looks a little angry and menacing. Doesn't it look like it's judging you for your past choices? Well, I have I not yet shared a meeting, Lee, as my animal avatar, but the day is young. And I think we should. I probably should have stopped recording this while we were playing. But I mean, this is the joy you get when you actually take time to review the uh, recording, I guess. <laughs> to restart the recording. Awesome. Excellent. So we are going to turn things over to our good friend, Daniel Andrade from Brock University. He is here with us um, in a mine of some sort. No, it's the fancy wall of the extension he is in. And I love that wall. I need to get me one. Uh, so Dan is going to be talking to us about the power of Power Automate. Over to you, Dan. Thank you, Randy. Uh, let me just share my screen here. Where did the share button go? Okay. Okay, can you see my screen okay? We sure can. Perfect, okay. So hello, uh, my name is Dan Andrade and I am the Library Systems Analyst here at Brock University. Today I will be showcasing Microsoft Power Automate, what it is, what we did with it, and why you should care. So what is Power Automate? You can read the description given by Microsoft themselves, but essentially Power Automate is an application that allows you to create automated workflows that bridge a widely diverse array of applications. It can replace external code in many places, can be used to fully implement or partially facilitate larger projects, 
but can also be used to automate small repetitive or high volume tasks as well. So what makes it cool and worth exploring? Um, it is first and foremost, very easy to use. It uses a remarkably simple and intuitive drag and drop interface that I was able to learn in very little time. There are many tools that claim to be easy to use and achieve that by way of sacrificing customizability and functionality. Power Automate is not one of them. The straightforwardness and clarity of the application does not hinder its capacity, capabilities in the slightest, though some of the more ambitious projects may take a little longer to work out and may require a dash of external code. Secondly, it is very well documented. It has a comprehensive official documentation site, but I also found many discussion posts, help topics, and online threads detailing how to accomplish specific things within the application. Additionally, since flows are shareable, it is even possible to retrieve a prefabricated flow that almost entirely, entirely solves your problem in seconds and then quickly tailor it to your needs. Finally, the integration capabilities are very comprehensive. Of course, all Office 365 applications and Microsoft products are available, but it also includes a massive number of third-party non-Microsoft apps spanning most commonly used workplace applications, connections to a good number of ticketing systems, as well as integrations for most database formats and hosts. Uh, I wanted to give you an idea of how extensive the third-party support is, so I made this slide. Um, but it, only, it still only scratches the surface. Uh, if, it, like if what you're working with is reasonably well known, chances are that it will be supported uh, by this, by Power Automate. How does it work? Uh, automated workflows or flows as they're called within Power Automate are initiated by a triggering event, such as an email being received or an HTTP request being made. Flows can be manually triggered as well, which allow more sensitive processes to be automated after some manual checks are completed. These, highly customizable, these are highly customizable and include many options for filtering. For example, you can, you can specify only triggering the flow when emails are received by certain senders or, when, when, or which contain certain subject terms. Logic, logical operations are then available, such as using conditionals, loops, or error catching based on the dynamic data received during the trigger event. There are a variety of ways to manipulate the input data, including array operations, text transformations, JSON querying, and variable functions. Arguably, some of these functions may be better implemented using code, but their existence means you do not need to know how to code to create highly specific flows. In some cases, also, the logistic challenge of hosting and maintaining code are substantial <clears throat> and outweigh the, the advantage it provides, so having an alternative can be very useful. You can then define actions that, will flow, that the flow will execute using that input data after it is passed through your logic. This is where the aforementioned integration capabilities really shine, as it can be very difficult to do simple things with code or other solutions when you want another application to deliver the end result. Another huge advantage is that you can make your flow take several simultaneous actions. Elsewhere, each individual action would be a separate challenge, but within Power Automate, adding widely deferring actions can be done with a few clicks. The only drawback is that if your desired trigger event or action is not already available, it can become very complex to build your workflow. Let's take a look at how we used it. Uh, so I came across Power Automate while implementing the commonly found Omni item level, prof item level report a problem button. Um, I was able to build the interface of the report form easily enough and embed it within our Omni pages, but I encountered a few obstacles while investigating a way to deliver the reports. Additionally, our staff wanted to have the reports tracked in an Excel spreadsheet so we could look at general error trends um, in order to identify larger issues and have visibility on which resources were the most problematic. We looked at WordPress forms, but anticipated that sending the users to a new page or making them fill out a long form were obstacles that discouraged report submission. We wanted a form that allowed users to describe their issue in depth and that would deliver the information that we needed to fix the issue, but that was seamless from a user experience perspective and could be submitted with very little effort. The, the nicer WordPress form plugins also involved a small subscription cost, which wasn't ideal. I also looked at third-party services such as Formspree that could take input directly from an embedded form, and this too was a viable option but the costs were higher and none of these services I came across perfectly did what we wanted. Oh, sorry, went too fast there. Um, I'll, uh, using a dedicated email server was a highly customizable avenue and, and could perfectly fulfill our needs 
but the option introduced new challenges in the areas of authentication and maintenance. That being said, this ultimately was the route I would have taken. Uh, tracking the, the reports in a spreadsheet was a problem that had to be solved separately in each of these cases, likely using some kind of API call. I really didn't relish the, uh, the, the, the endeavor of having to figure that out and uh, was on the verge of recommending the tracking be completed manually. Luckily for me, I discovered Power Automate. This was a tool for which we already had a premium license, as many of you may also have, eliminating the cost problem. It could retrieve the data directly from the Omni page, so the embedded form was all we needed. We could retrieve most of the relevant information from the PNX record and just pass along, pass that along with the basic problem description and contact email that would be needed to retrieve from the user, which helped encourage our users to utilize the feature. Its place within the Microsoft ecosystem removed all authentication issues and deferred most of the maintenance and organically combined both delivery and tracking demands into a single challenge. Uh, to go over our solution to this in a bit more detail, um, we first collected the report details in a small JSON object and sent them to the flow using a post call. Oh, uh, you know what? I'm going to skip forward through this slide just because it's, uh, I want to go to a, my, a different example here. So I mentioned earlier that Power Automate could help you automate a tiny repetitive task that I thought would provide an example for, of this for you. Uh, so I get Teams messages and emails sometimes from my colleagues that represent work items or tasks, but which are not always big enough to require a ticket. I use Asana as a kind of personal ticketing system to track these smaller items, but found the overhead of making these items quite tedious. I would read the request and copy the message into an Asana card, so I would, ha so I would have the details of the task in the card itself and not go have to go hunting for the message to figure out what exactly I was supposed to do. This isn't a huge amount of work, but repet re repeated hundreds of times, it really adds up. Um, and I really didn't find a solution for this. I mean, that there is an Outlook integration, but not one for Teams. Um, so I wasn't really able to do this. Uh, but Power Automate does have an integration for Asana. And I found a flow online, which allowed me to very quickly uh, create a flow that uh, copies the, the description into a task and, um, and just submits the task for me to solve later. It might be a small thing, but it gives me a lot of joy every single time I use it, which is typically at least once a day. Um, so thank you for attending my presentation. Um, I really hope this helped you, helps you make cool things or saves you some time in the long run and effort like it did for me. I'm still pretty new to the platform myself, but I will do my best to answer any questions you may have. And my email is up on the screen if any of you want to get in contact. Awesome, thank you so much, Dan. So we're open for questions. Remember, you can put them in the chat on the right-hand side, or you can use the reactions button at the bottom of the screen and choose the raise hand so that uh, we can see you would like to unmute and ask a question. Ask away, friends. I think of one of the power automates that I used really early on. Oh, Walter has one. Hi, have you ever captured the incoming URL? Uh, yes. So that was that's a good question because we actually had an instance where um, our staff were like they couldn't figure out why exactly there was an error because they went to the page and you know they weren't able to figure it out and um, and so I did I was able to capture that in the uh, in the JavaScript um, in the customization customization package. So that's one of the things that we send across and and that way. Uh, our staff can just go to the URL that the user was actually at when they encountered the issue, and uh, that helped us resolve some of those issues. Excellent. I think I had one, you could do this with an email rule, usually in most email clients, but I had it where uh, when my mom got emailed her schedule, it would forward it to me, so I got her schedule. That's a beautiful so that's usage. A <laughs> <laughs> Super simple one, right? And like I said, you can you do that with email uh, rules too, but it was like, eh. Yeah, and sometimes like there, there are things that are really too small to like code, you know, um, but you can make a little flow and it's, it's super useful. Yeah, I know another one I've seen people do is for the email notifications that um, Alma can do. So for example, when you know, you can set up a notify me when Google Scholar processes or when your um, 
exports your holdings to Google Scholar. Mm -hmm. And I think before, I don't know if you can now, but before you could only have one email address that was put in there to be notified for that. But now you can put multiples. But anyway, so we would have it sent to a different address and then you could flow it to a list or something like that. Matt says, that's a nice integration solution. Dan, thanks for sharing. Yeah, it saved me a lot of time and that's what kind of convinced me to, uh, to present it. Excellent. Well, join me in thanking Daniel Andrade from Brooke. Thanks, Dan. Okay, we've got about, oh, hold on, C-Mac has a question. No, she doesn't. She was clapping with one hand. Um, so thank you so much, Dan. And we have three minutes before our next session with Jax Cato and Sean Hendricks from Western University. Uh, and in that time, my question for you is cake or pie? If you had to choose one, which are you going to choose? Ooh, okay, lots of pies, lots of pies. I'm on team cake myself. Have you heard of the dessert version of turducken, which is basically a cake, a pie, you bake it, and then you put it inside of a cake batter, and then you bake that. Um, yes, pie cake -in. Thank you, Susan. I knew there was a name for it. Uh, Jacqueline Wood Appleby says the best cake is better than the best pie, but I would enjoy a mediocre pie more than a bad cake. Yeah, cakes can go bad real quickly. And I mean, ooh, a cruffin. Yes. Yes. Uh, at least a pie cake. <laughs> oh, that's good. Ooh, a flan. Okay. Yes, Janice. Um, if you have a farm boy in your neighborhood, um, not the person, the uh, grocery store, they sell a wide variety of cruffins with all sorts of fillings inside. Ooh, yes. Uh, also, I feel like for me, and I'm just going to throw this out here, if a cake doesn't have buttercream icing, it is not worth it. That's what I'm going to say. Like, if you go to Zayers and you get that, the cake, like, it is cake, but it's like, why? Why am I bothering? Oh, yes, there's that cake show on, yes, uh, where they make cakes. Or ganache, Megan, I am on board for ganache. Absolutely. Uh, Rebecca, yes, I am also on board for cheesecake. It's a good time. Evelyn Smith, you know what I've had? Uh, cheesecake Factory America. They used to have a cheesecake, which was carrot cake cheesecake. And it was a cheesecake with chunks of carrot cake inside of it. And never nuts in, a, in anything, in my opinion. Just throwing it out there. It's not a popular opinion. Oh, Laura, we are friends. Okay, uh, it is 11.10. We are going to hand things over to our Jax and Sean, uh, who are going to be doing a presentation for us on OCL CF evidence-based acquisitions. Over to you guys. Thanks, Randy. So good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Sean Hendricks, and I'm joined here with my colleague, Jax Cato. And today we'll be discussing the implications and opportunities uh, for collaborative futures as OCL potentially moves to pursue a shared EBA program. Uh, so for those of you who may be unfamiliar with EBA programs, I'll provide a brief uh, overview. In a nutshell, uh, the library or consortium commits a certain amount of funds up front in order to access a collection of titles greater than the value of the commitment. And it's super important that these titles be discoverable for the duration of the EBA agreement. And at the conclusion of the EBA term, the library or consortium selects titles primarily based on usage, hence the name evidence-based acquisition. Uh, in the fall of 2021, the uh, OCL Information Resources Committee, known as OCL IR, set up a working group that Jackson and I joined and I chaired to investigate the uh, feasibility of an EBA at the consortial level. 
The report submitted to Oakle IR in spring 2022 shared instances of EBA successes at other consortia, demonstrated a willingness of vendors to work with Oakle, and explored two models for Oakle IR to consider, which I will explain in the next slide. After discussing these models and the working group's recommendations, Oakle IR agreed to submit a proposal to Oakle's Board of Directors for a shared Oakle EBA pilot. This proposal is in the works and will be sent in the upcoming days. As mentioned before, there are two EBA models that came out of the uh, working group's report. The standard model works the same as EBA set up by individual schools, but with the benefit of negotiating pricing at the local level. The shared model, which is preferred for the pilot, entails participating schools selecting the same titles to own at the end of the EBA. Collaborative Futures would be uniquely positioned to take advantage of the shared EBA model with efficient record loading via the Alma Network Zone, which can uh, reduce the staff workload. And now I uh, will turn it over to Jax. Thanks, Sean. Uh, traditionally, Ocol's ebook collecting has been uh, flexible opt-in purchases of annual or subject collections as chosen by the institutions. Ocol manages the negotiation and licensing process and aids in discussions for local load on Scholars Portal. However, we did run a patron-driven acquisitions pilot in 2010, which was both successful and unsuccessful, depending on your definition of success. On the one hand, many participating institutions are still using the purchase titles. However, small schools saw little advantage through the program with little usage of the purchase titles. As well, Ocal worked with ProQuest and neither of us had managed a PDA before. There were many mistakes made and we burned through our deposited funds in about a week. Next slide. Um, so the Ocal IR Consortial Working Group met with Orbis Cascade, an American uh, multi-state consortia to discuss their success with managing EBAs at the consortial level. Along with this meeting, the working group provided a literature review and the following needs were expressed to set a consortia up for success. The need for clarity of consortial and institutional goals, vendor flexibility, the ability to pivot membership, change content pools, increase or decrease funding and to change the multiplier. Communication, both between consortia members and internally at individual institutions and the need to provide incentive for smaller institutions to remain part of the deal after the pilot. There are also obstacles to consider, including managing duplicate purchases, the user needs being too distinct to agree on shared content, institutions choosing different content pools and thus not being able to take advantage of any consortially negotiated multipliers, ownership of titles after purchase, and if the title is available for sharing among consortial members. Next slide. So ideally, an OCL team would create an EBA criteria, which would be negotiated with the chosen vendor. The EBA would have full OCL participation, meaning that all members of OCL participate in the pilot year. Uh, this, in my experience, uh, getting full local participation for anything has been uh, not easy. Um, so we might be able to redefine what full means uh, to meet our needs for this EBA. But ideally, this would include 19 of the 21 local schools. The funding would be at the local level using internal funds, perhaps deposited, deposited for new initiatives, thus no participant would have to pay to play, so to speak. Then in subsequent years, the local team assigned to this project would create an equitable cost share based on the usage and purchased content from the pilot year. Schools could then make an educated decision on continuing participation based on the cost sharing, the results of the pilot, and internal criteria. As well, this is an opportunity for Ocal to try out new methods of collaborative collecting using Alma's network zone. This would certainly be a deviation from how Ocal normally collects and it brings a wide range of possibilities, but also many questions like, can Ocal own a collection if it lives in the network zone and who would be responsible for its maintenance? 
what would it mean for Oakville to own a collection and what would it mean for the institutions to not own that collection? Would Oakville own only the pilot collection or subsequent years as well? What happens if schools choose different pools of content? Would Oakville only own the titles that achieved a, thresh a threshold of use across the schools? If Oakville does not own the collection, who would be responsible for it? And many more fun questions like that. It was not in the scope of the working group to answer these questions, but the exploration is exciting and forward thinking for Ogle. Next slide. Uh, and that's it. Do you have any questions? Excellent. Thank you very much, guys. So open for questions. Again, at the bottom of the screen, use that reactions button to raise your hand if you'd like to unmute and ask a question or the chat on the right hand side, you can type in there. Can we have a question from Susan Bond? Would the redefined full OCL be the collaborative future libraries? Not necessarily. Um, there are there is still um, a couple of schools who have not participated in collaborative features and may or may not in the future. However, um, we had discussed how it would work to have CF and non-CF schools, and we figured that it, it could still work, that, that those schools would need to load their own records, and uh, we would collect their usage afterwards, and we would uh, mush them all together so we had a, a full picture. Excellent. We have a question from Ian Gibson from Guelph. This is ultimately what CF should be about, an local collection that we all benefit from. And Krista Foley asks, are many local schools doing an EBA program now on their own? I don't have the, the number off the top of my head, but I, I would say that there, there are a significant number who are uh, running EBAs and um, across a, a wide variety of publishers and slightly different models as well. Some are doing more front lists, some are doing the entire collection or focusing on back lists. So there's really a mix there. Excellent. And Jeff Sinclair asks, does Ogle own any content now? No, it, this would be a totally new uh, situation for Ogle to be in. Excellent. Any other questions from folks? Ian says, when can we get the ball rolling? I uh, still have to uh, get approval from the board of directors at OCO. Um, so stay tuned. Yeah, so maybe years. <laughs> uh, it would be great if we get, could get an EBA going for January, um, but uh, don't hold me to it. Samuel Cassidy asks, do you have a sense on what the discount structure might look like? For example, if 15 schools have access to a title, would we be paying less than 15 times the title cost? Yeah, so uh, it's hard to say what would come out of the negotiations, but um, based on our discussions with other schools and with the vendors, my understanding is that it would be um, uh, less than the, the total number of schools that would be participating. So there would be a multiplier still, um, because obviously there's multiple schools participating and owning the same content, but it would be less than the total. Okay, please join me in thanking Sean and Jax from Western. Thanks guys.
All right, and now we have about four minutes until our next session starts. And our next session is Bridging the Distance with Omni and Rialto with Gisela and Chris and Kim from Lakehead. Uh, and so just before we get to that, um, you know, I got another question. And my question for you guys, oh no, I forgot. Oh, what is one of your favorite desserts? So I'm getting a little meta, right? In keeping with the metadata and things. Uh, so we did pie, we did berry, we did cake. Now we're doing dessert. So what's one of your favorite desserts? Apple crisp. Oh yeah, raspberry mousse, rhubarb crisp, a bowl of fruit. Okay. Pavlova, Stalin, or Stalin, if you will. Naomi bars, as as you know, some people call them. Hot caramel sundae, okay. Cranberry dark chocolate tart. Oh, oh, we're getting links now. I like this. Frozen strawberry squares, second dinner. Mm, okay, Samuel, you're one of those savory guys instead of the sweets, eh? Frozen strawberry squares, fruit and cheese board, that's a goodie. Lemon squares, lemon tart. Okay, I'm starting to see a theme. Potato chips, Gisela is also a savory gal by the looks of things here. Donuts, yes. Lemon pudding cakes. I'm just getting us all ready for lunch, right? Which I'm sure you have these treats just in your kitchen. You're ready for the tasting. Oh, Jax is just whipped cream. Like, screw everything else. Just give me the whipped cream. There is a bakery. I'm keeping an eye on the time. There is a bakery near my hometown. And it is in the tiniest little place. There is no stoplight at all there is a post office. No, that's literally it. Um, and it is called Cortland Bakery, if you're curious. Anyways, they are a German bakery and they have cream, or sorry, they have eclairs that are like the size of your head and they are $2.25. And they have chocolate buttercream icing on the outside and they are filled with real whipped cream. Yeah, I wouldn't lie to you. They are amazing. And they are so cheap. Yeah. Randy, I go to that bakery once in a while. Those uh, chocolate donuts are awesome as well. Yes, they yeah. do. They have everything. They have, yeah, they make their own donuts. They make their own breads. They make their own pies. They make their own cookies, everything. Turnovers, they have this thing called a um, cheese crown. So imagine, if you will, turnover like pastry. Right. So it's like sort of like um, lots of layers, fluffy. That is in a, a muffin tin. Then they put graham cracker with butter, put that down there. Then they put cheesecake. Then they put fruit toppings on top. And those are also like $2.25. I don't know how these people make money. And yes, Ali, it is between Delhi and Tilsonburg. And Adam has found it to include pictures. <laughs> yes, so good, so good. I often like, I'm like, you guys need to charge more. Anyways, it is 11.25. It is time for us to officially turn things over to our good friends, Gisela, Chris, and Kim from Lakehead University who are going to be doing a presentation for us on bridging the distance with Omni and Rialto. Over to you guys. Great, thank you. I will just share my screen here. Okay, awesome, we'll get started. Hi everyone, my name is Gisela and I'm here with my two colleagues at Lakehead University, uh, Kim Valley and Chris Tomasini. And I would like to acknowledge, first of all, that I'm on the Thunder Bay campus of Lakehead University, which is located on the traditional territory of the Fort William First Nation signatory to the Robinson Superior Treaty of 1850. And in the spirit of reconciliation, I'm grateful to learn, live, and work here. Lake Aurelia is located on the traditional territory of the Anishinaabeg. The Anishinaabeg include the Ojibwe, Adawa, and Potawatomi nations, collectively known as the Three Fires Confederacy. We hope that this presentation will help anyone that's coordinating services for a multi-campus university, specifically those who are challenged by a large geographical distance between their campuses, uh, like Lakehead University with campuses in both Thunder Bay and Aurelia. 
Um, our two campuses, as you can see here, are separated by about uh, just over 1,220 kilometers, 760 miles, or it's about a 14 hour road trip. Um, now we acknowledge that some of you may already be offering the services that we're going to describe today, but we wanted to tell you how Lake had used Omni, Alma, and Rialto to help us bridge this distance, and specifically how we were able to offer unified services for the Faculty of Education on both campuses. So I'm going to I'm going to begin with a really brief history of the Faculty of Education at Lakehead University, just so that you have some context. Um, the undergraduate teacher program was a part of post-secondary education in Northwestern Ontario since the 1960s um, with the Lakehead Teachers College in Thunder Bay. And this college joined Lakehead University in 1970 to become the Faculty of Education. Jump forward 36 years in 2006, Lakehead University opened up a second campus at Heritage Place in downtown Aurelia. And uh, the Bachelor of Education was one of the programs that was offered there. So the Faculty of Education's overarching goal um, was to develop this expanded faculty to be integrated and unified, um, a unified academic unit across both campuses. So since 2006, this faculty has developed into a comprehensive faculty and uh, the Aurelia campus specifically has seen a lot of growth. It started with a small pro program of about 200 students and in the fall we will welcome over 600 students in the B. Ed. program. Um, and so there are two actual education libraries on both these campuses. Um, and they're both part of the Lakehead, the larger Lakehead University library system. And the staff at both libraries, we work really closely together to develop this unified library service and uh, collections for both the faculty and students on both campus. It's a work in progress. We've faced a lot of challenges. Uh, because of this big geographical location, um, but our commitment is to uh, provide equitable access to library resources for all Lakehead users, regardless of, of their location. So with that in mind, here are some challenges that we've experienced that are specific to Lakehead University. First of all, just the, the geographical distance. Um, and and it, it is a 14 hour road trip between the two campuses. Um, and also with IUTS, we can receive incoming deliveries in Thunder Bay, but IUTS pickups are not possible in both Thunder Bay or Aurelia. And we're a single resource sharing location, uh, so all items are delivered to Thunder Bay and then they're redirected to Alma. So we were able to um, make Alma and Omni and Rialto work for us, and we were able to achieve two really uh, important and coordinated services for the Faculty of Ed, uh, the Faculty of Education. First of all, we created, uh, we've been able to create shared subject specific li lists of both print and ebook titles with Omni Collections. And with this virtual display tool, we were able to promote our collections equally to faculty and students in both of our campuses. And secondly, with Omni, Omni and Alma, it was possible for us to offer a more seamless request service for our faculty and students, regardless of location, in a way that surpassed our previous Voyager system. Uh, so I'll turn it over to Kim right now, and she'll tell us how we set up Omni Collections, and then Chris will tell us about our improved request service. Thank you. So as Giselle mentioned, we. Uh, showcase both education libraries um, to all our users um, by using collection discovery, which uh, for those of you who may not be familiar, it's a tool that allows users to browse a curated list of library items. So um, our collections, we make sure to include a combination of titles, obviously from both campuses. Um, we regularly refresh them, um, especially the new book collections and we add additional themed collections as needed. Um, we promote these collections by linking them on our education library homepage and through email updates that come from either the education librarian or directly from the Dean in his, uh, in his updates. Uh, next slide. So when we were planning uh, what collections we wanted to create, we recognized that ebooks are especially good at addressing equity and access. 
to library resources. So we, we definitely wanted to create a new education ebooks collection. However, we ran into a small challenge uh, with uh, keeping it up to date. Um, we use Alma Analytics uh, to create lists of um, new acquisitions, um, uh, new education library acquisitions, but we couldn't seem to generate a reliable list of new ebooks that only included education titles. Um, but then our colleague, Liz Boileau, who is currently away on parental leave, she figured out that we could use order history in Rialto instead. Next slide. So I won't go into the process, but basically we use the facets on the left to generate a list of new education eBooks. And uh, then we export that list to Excel. Um, uh, one thing, if, if you want to try this, just note that um, you have to set the date range at the top first. For some reason, it seems to reset all the other facets. So start with the date. Um, but besides that, it's really working well for us. Um, the only thing that I think would make this even better is if we could create a set directly from here in the order history, uh, and that would make it easier to bulk add titles to uh, the collection. Um, sure. Thanks. Um, so basically, their uh, collections are great. Um, it's easy for users to click through and place requests. And on to Chris to talk more about requests. Okay, so uh, bridging the distance for physical books. Um, so we've needed to do this since 2006 when the Aurelia campus was launched. And uh, we were a Voyager institution, so um, we used Voyager for this initially. Uh, next slide. So just a couple of screenshots here for those of you who were Voyager institutions who want a few flashbacks and nightmares. Uh, next slide, Gisela. Um, so making book requests was possible through Voyager. Uh, calls to requests, and this facilitated getting books back and forth from uh, Aurelia to Thunder Bay and Thunder Bay to Aurelia using our intercampus mail. Um, it wasn't slick, but it, it worked. It was okay. Uh, next slide. Um, now, when Alma Omni came along and was launched, we knew that we needed to continue to do this. We, we, uh, we had to be able to get books back and forth between Thunder Bay and Aurelia and have students able to request uh, books back and forth. So we were an early adopter of the request features um, that, uh, that we had been using uh, through Voyager as well. Uh, next slide. So um, we're all familiar with these now, post the AFN, um, but as soon as we had Omni and, and Alma, we needed to, to set this up. So we set up um, Omni Alma so that students could place physical requests to send books to different library locations. Uh, next slide. So what's not always well known is that Aurelia actually has two separate libraries, even in Aurelia. So um, you see the two Aurelia ones there and then the three Thunder Bay ones. So students uh, right from the get-go with Omni Alma could request a book to be sent to any of those libraries for pickup. Uh, next slide. So uh, while, while Voyager worked, um, it, it, Nobody, nobody would say it was the best. Uh, and Omni Alma it has been a definite improvement. Um, it's, it's been a single sign-on system with Omni Alma, which wasn't always the case with Voyager. Um, Omni has a much more friendly request form, and it's been a more seamless process for staff compared to Voyager. Now, Voyager was software sitting on a computer, and Omni, with, with its cloud-based system, was obviously way more flexible for us through the uh, through the pandemic. Uh, next slide. Uh, Back one, yeah. So uh, going forward, uh, our users will continue to use Omni to place requests for print items to be sent back and forth. Um, as IUTS does not deliver to Aurelia, we, we presume that transferring books internally within Lakehead will be faster than AFN loans for the foreseeable future. Uh, but the AFN and the Pick Up Anywhere options are amazing and have been a huge boon to all of us and uh, allow our students to access even more resources than just what we have at Lakehead. And I think that's it. And we have time now for questions from the province and from all your cow avatars and your, your <laughs> raccoon avatars. <laughs> Excellent. Thanks so much, guys. So open for questions. Uh, again, use the reactions button at the bottom of the screen and the raise hand option to unmute yourself and ask a question or type your question in the box on the right hand side.
your presentation reminded me that we have to revisit that whole conversation with the heads of access services about delivering materials directly to institutions as opposed to the other place. So it's on my mind again. Yeah, you mean to like Aurelia, for example, Randy? Yeah, you got it. To, yeah. Oh, one thing I was going to um, mention, if it didn't come up, um, if anyone's wondering more about how to add titles to collections, I don't know how many, um, I think libraries are using those, that collection discovery piece, but um, uh, I, I kind of glossed over it, but there's like multiple ways to add titles to the collections. If you're just doing a handful, you can add them manually. You just search a title and then click add. Um, or you could generate a list using um, analytics and um, make that into a set. And then there's an option to add titles from set. Oh. Um, and then, or you could scan barcodes. So if you have a pile of new books, you could scan barcodes into an Excel spreadsheet and then turn that into a set. Um, and I think there's maybe some third party um, add-on. I don't know if anyone's using that. For, um, for scanning in barcodes and creating sets automatically and skipping that middle step with Excel. So lots of options. I just put in chat, we have a, we track some of the featured usage. And one of the things we track is the Alma collection discovery, which is what Ex Libris calls it. Uh, and so there's a fair number of, of schools that are, are using it. So yeah, it's interesting to hear those various options. Maybe we could lure you into doing a presentation on that next time. We'll see. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions for our good friends at Lakehead? Okay, well, join me in thanking Gisela, Kim, and Christopher from Lakehead. Thanks, guys. Excellent. And I'm just double checking the schedule. Our next session starts essentially right now, so there's going to be no question. Uh, I'll have to think of a good one for the next round. Uh, and our next presentation is Pascal Calarco from the University of Windsor and from R.O. Carl, Visiting Program Officer. And he is going to be talking to us about using ALMA and PRIMO to enable the Marrakesh Treaty Fulfillments, an interim report. So I'm gonna hand it over to you, Pascal. Thanks, Randy. Let's see, get set up here. Um, so I've presented previously on um, Marrakesh in a variety of places. I really want to talk about our summer work plan for you folks and what we uh, hope to do. Um, I've included a couple slides for those of you who don't know what Marrakesh is. Basically, it's the first user rights uh, copyright um, uh, WIPO treaty uh, that came into effect in 2013. And then each country has to ratify it. So Canada ratified in 2016 and the United States in 2019. And there's a whole bunch more um, that are in process. There's uh, so far 80 countries who have signed this. Um, the, uh, this project started uh, back in September, 2020. And the whole idea is that 7% of the world's books are only uh, available uh, in accessible format. So we want to try to leverage um, the research library corpus that we have um, uh, within the two countries um, to make those available to users. And there's a variety of um, uh, work that goes on in this. Uh, we have a metadata working group. We have an implementation working group, which I'm gonna be talking about. Um, a beneficiaries working group where we uh, interact with folks who are uh, print disabled or blind and to better understand uh, their working environments and incorporate some of those functional requirements into that. And then we have another group that just tries to 
coordinate um, all of the above work. So we want to um, <clears throat> provide some recommendations for high quality descriptions, um, which might uh, go as uh, um, metadata recommendations for uh, new uses of Mark 21 fields. Um, we want to also look at how one creates um, accessible formats, ideally from print books, um, but also from born digital, and then uh, create a, uh, a framework for how libraries can do this um, over time uh, across uh, international borders. There's a whole host of people um, involved in the task force, uh, those are the folks here. Um, we're focusing on three accessible formats. So EPUB is an international standard that you might use on your Kindle or your Kobo reader or uh, even your desktop. <clears throat> DAISY is a talking book standard. Um, it's also a NISO standard. And PDF, uh, you all know PDF, and uh, that's a, a standard format as well. So this is these are the three main formats that um, uh, folks who are beneficiaries to Marrakesh would typically use. <clears throat> so our pilot is to be as practical as possible, to take the um, technology that we have in hand as part of the Alma Primo stack and to see how far we can get in uh, lending these between uh, two uh, uh, libraries. And so we selected um, two libraries, both in um, as part of consortia. Uh, so we have the University of Florida and uh, we're using the um, University of Windsor Sandbox um, here in Ocal uh, for the project. <clears throat> I should also mention that uh, Ocal Scholars Portal is going to be joining the FRAME project, which is um, a project to create a, um, a metadata um, uh, XML-based uh, repository uh, both of metadata and um, uh, the the objects um, that builds on the uh, the ACE portal work that uh, Scholars Portal has been doing for a number of years now too. So another reason why we're starting with Alma and Primo: seventy three percent of ARL members are now using Alma and Primo, so we can get more people on board if we have some documentation on how to do this. And I'd like to say that this is a prototyping test and we're not planning on uh, implementing any of the stuff that you're going to hear at this point. We're just uh, trying to see what's possible. So we have two sandbox environments and we're going to be configuring and implementing a um, revised Mark 21 template for accessible materials. We're going to configure Alma and implement new uh, collection locations for these works. Uh, we will be looking at configuring repository storage to hold those um, digital objects, configuring resource sharing, which may include uh, ISO ILL targets and a digitization request workflow, <clears throat> possibly configuring restricted access Primo VE views of the, each of these. And a uh, stretch goal is looking at uh, seeing what we can do with authentication and authorization for these. The Mark 21 recommendations I'll go through quickly. Um, we've come up with a number of um, recommendations around content and media types. The 341 is really important for noting accessible content. Um, similarly, the 385 and 521 and 532 accessibility notes and target audiences can be really useful if uh, we want to um, hang um, facets uh, based on, on these fields and maybe create a facet for accessible works in the future. 
There's a number of perspectives on fulfillment for this. You know, there's been a lot of work done in controlled digital lending. Could this be a use case for CDL? Uh, there's a copyright mismatch there because Marrakesh um, allows for free, unfettered, non-DRM access that can be given freely without any kind of cost uh, to any beneficiary anywhere in any uh, Marrakesh Treaty country. Um, and CDL does not presuppose that, but it uses a lot of the same workflow. Resource sharing, you know, certainly um, ISO ILL um, connections with external libraries. There are some limitations with that too. You can only um, have so many of these definitions. Um, and digitization requests, you know, it, it might be nice to receive an ILL request and fulfill it as a digitization request as a non-returnable. Uh, we want to see if um, any of that workflow is possible. Uh, repository needs. So you need somewhere to store these things. Uh, the OLRC uh, within Ontario is a good place for this. And we'd like to see if there's any kind of authentication hooks that uh, can be done. And uh, we also have um, an Alma digital uh, option uh, here at Windsor. This is AWS storage and it's tightly integrated with Alma and Primo. Um, Authentication and authorization is uh, something we want to look at. Some kind of tokenized access um, that would allow patrons to look at these completely. Um, some other publishing metadata possibilities and decisions we have to do and how to discover those things in an aggregated way. So this summer, we're going to be doing uh, the configuration through August and then redo those changes after the August sandbox refresh, do internal testing, uh, both at Florida and within local um, through uh, December, and then do external testing again before the February uh, sandbox refresh, write this up and submit it to Arl and Carl, uh, in spring of next year. Uh, the folks who are working on this this summer include myself, Hyun Kao at York and a couple folks at Florida. And I'd be happy to answer any questions. Excellent, this is amazing work. Thank you, Pascal. So we have a few minutes for questions. Again, you can use the uh, reactions button at the bottom of your screen and raise your hand using the raise hand feature to unmute yourself and ask a question. On the far right hand side, you can also use the chat so you can type a question into chat as well. I was surprised to see 73% of our institutions are Primo Alma customers. It's not so much in Canada. In Canada, I would say it's more like half or maybe even 40%. But in the US, yes, yeah, Six Libras has done a a good job in selling their systems down there. Yeah. So. Okay, everyone. Well, thank me in joining Pat or and joining for thanking Pascal for his great presentation on the Marrakesh Marrakesh Treaty work that they've been working on. Uh, thanks so much, Pascal. Thank you. And now I'm going to turn it over to Annika Urban Ward, who is going to summarize things. And I just wanted to thank all of our presenters for all of their great presentations, too. Thanks, guys. And over to you, Annika. Thanks, Randy. Um, just give me a moment. I'm going to put a slide up for you all. It's interesting trying to share. Okay, I'll just do it like this. Um, thanks, 
again, I reiterate Randy's thanks to all of our presenters. It was really uh, wonderful seeing such a, a broad range of really the, the nitty gritty, hands on demonstrations of things, um, tips and tricks, and also some some broader ideas of where we might be able to go as a, as a consortium or even broader than that to, to utilize the technology that we have. So thanks very much for that. Thanks to Randy for leading us through that and for all of the, um, the food quizzes. Um, hopefully you, you all have, have your, your food, um, food ordering apps already clocked up for all of those desserts that you're gonna order this afternoon. Mm -hmm. Um, I also wanted to do a big thank you to our organizing um, organizing committee. Um, thank you to Jordan Bulbrook, um, Jax Cato, Madeline Donnelly, Colleen McKinnon, Randy Allman, and of course, Jeff Sinclair as well. Thanks for the time that you all put in to help coordinate, uh, coordinate presenters and um, put together this show for us. Um, as as Catherine mentioned at the beginning, this is really um, one of the one of the great ways that we can use the the collaboration that we have to to share uh, our work in in this system, and and it is always seems to be really popular. And um, so, thanks everyone for your work on that. Thanks everyone for for attending and for your great questions for the presenters as well. As well, um, let me just move over here for a minute. So. Um, I don't know if Michael is on the call as well. And if you, I am. If you wanted to jump in for a moment. Sure, I am. Thanks, Annika. Um, hi, everyone. I did want to jump in just for uh, a moment to speak to a couple of things that are going on uh, with our Collaborative Futures initiative. And um, one of the things that I wanted to do was just give a reminder. I know we've um, had some verbal updates at various meetings, including this one uh, in Catherine's introduction, noting that um, Mandy Deans Cassie's is um, now done her secondment to Opal and has returned to Brock. And that, um, well, Randy had completed his secondment sometime back in last September uh, and has been uh, working on a, on a part-time basis um, to provide some coverage during that time. Um, so while we're uh, working to fill two positions, I just did want to remind folks that uh, you can still get in touch with the Opal office. Annika has helpfully put up a slide here that has the email us, uh, line there. There's an address that you can reach out to with, um, with any questions and um, we'll, we'll certainly work to get back to you. But um, while we're working to restaff up Collaborative Futures, uh, our, our ability to kind of support significant initiatives is, is somewhat limited. So um, we're, we're providing some, some continuity and I can just give a brief update on our, uh, on our hiring processes. We have two positions. One is an Omni Network Zone and Technology Specialist role uh, that uh, the posting has closed and that we are hopefully just about wrapping up the, uh, the hiring process there. And the other position is an OPAL uh, Assistant Director of Collaborative Initiatives position, and we're very much in the same place there. So I am hopeful that within the next week or two that we will be able to share some good news with you all about, uh, about appointments for, for those two positions and that um, over the summer months we'll have folks uh, on board in those roles and that will be um, well supported for collaborative futures um, by the uh, by the fall months and, and able to continue on so i did just want to say those uh give that update um and this um maybe among my last updates to 
Um, to Opal in my role as interim executive director, I'll be finishing up this role in what are we, June 20, in about 10 days or so at the end of this month. Um, and we're also expecting that uh, Opal will have an announcement shortly about how the executive director role will be filled on another interim basis while the search for a five-year term executive director is completed. So that's um, what I wanted to share with, uh, with this group, um, just to give everyone a, a bit of an update on where things are with staffing and hopefully uh, shore up your confidence that uh, that staffing will be in, in place to continue supporting this, um, what I think is an amazing initiative. So that's it for me. Thanks all. Thanks, Michael. Um, so just a couple of things as we finish off. Um, as Michael mentioned, we've got the Opal CF email there. That's how you can contact the team. Um, and Randy has also put the feedback form into um, the chat there. Uh, we'd love to hear your feedback on this um, mini conference and any ideas you might have for, for future mini conferences. Um, we hope to be able to do this um, again, I guess, maybe towards the end of the year. Um, and of course, we will be posting the recordings as well as slides on the Spot Docs Wiki, and we've got a link down the bottom there. Um, we're hoping to make the, the recordings um, uh, publicly available as well. So stay tuned for that. Um, thank you very much, everyone. Enjoy your summer and please reach out to us if you have any questions. And Annika, you missed thanking yourself. Oh, yeah. Thank you to Annika for all of the hard work she did in pulling this all together. Thanks, Annika. Thanks. Thanks, everyone. <laughs> There's an arm behind you. <laughs> no, I, have, I have a random arm in the house. <laughs> okay, thanks everyone.